captured by women is brought to you by Nido Fortigro your love their future Hello, good afternoon, welcome and thank you for joining us here on TV3. You're watching Captured by Women. We're going to delve into three key issues that flooded the news throughout the week. First, we're going to look at the Mortuary Workers Association who have issued a warning that they will be going on strike if government does not meet certain demands that they are requesting. Uh, the question is, should government meet these demands or should we prepare to bury our own dead? Now, we'll also be looking at the budget 2019. The minority has slammed the budget, calling it mere rhetoric. Now, they insist that the financial sector is in fact in recession and they are not satisfied with interventions made by government. What are the facts? We'll have Joe Jackson in studio and he'll be speaking to these issues. We'll also look at the Special Prosecutor's Office. It has been allocated a sum of 180 million Ghana cities in the 2019 budget. Does this nullify the allegations that government through its actions or inactions have been frustrating the fight of corruption by the Special Prosecutor's Office? We'll be going into the details right here on Captured by Women. I am not staring at first alone today. I'll be doing that with my colleague Rosmond Aite. This program, remember, is sponsored by Nido and GTP. We're going to go for a break. When we come back, we go straight into the issues. Stay with us. So thanks for staying with us. The Mortuary Workers Association of Ghana, earlier this week, threatened to go on strike. But after meeting the health ministry, they've put the strike on hold, but are still threatening to do so if they suspect any form of foul play from the health ministry. Now, the question is, must there always be some form of a threat of strike before ministers or sectors rise up to the occasion? Nuang, what do you think? I mean, they listed quite a tall number of issues that they were unhappy about. Must that always be the norm, that you are not heard until you threaten some form of strike action? Unfortunately, um, that seems to have become the norm. Mm. Uh, which shouldn't be because when you create a precedence like this, then it's difficult to control the actions of other unions going forward mm -hmm. because they all come under the impression that we are going to rise up and we're going to agitate and cause some confusion and then government will listen to us. Mm. If we don't take care, we'll be heading towards a very disorderly reaction for most unions. But my issue is with exactly the problems that they have raised, mm -hmm. exactly. which includes, you know, not having access to leave days. Exactly. They um, work on weekends yes. without overtime. Yes, mm. yes. And they work too many hours. Mm. Everyone who is giving out essentials, and I put them under essential services, because basically if mortuary workers go on strike, there will be crisis. Mm -hmm. You and I It'll cannot crisis, go into yeah. the mortuary yeah. and work, uh, you know, do what they do. So obviously it's going to their essential services. Now, everybody deserves some decency in their line of mm -hmm. duty. Mm -hmm. And if you're not giving them leave, you're not giving them holidays, they're working themselves mm -hmm. to death, mm -hmm. literally. Yeah. And only to end up in the same place, exactly. you know, that they are working. Mm -hmm. But what happens if they go on strike? Mm -hmm. uh, is government now going to come and say, we will give you leave? And why hasn't it been provided for? this whole time mm. you know why did it take all this agitation I mean, like you said you know from from the statement they released i think they mentioned that they started engaging government or sending petitions to government since october last year and then in june and september also they sent you know uh, petitions but they had nothing and so therefore decided you know to go on strike so it looks like um, government or the health ministry let me be more specific was given the opportunity you know to engage but did apparently nothing until this threat came in. And one of the issues they talk about is that even their personal protective, protective wear, it's yeah, not, it's they not, don't have it. Yeah, and, they you don't know, have it. And this and is a disease prone yeah. environment. And so many people have died from mm -hmm. different causes. Mm -hmm. And they're all together mm -hmm. in, in mm -hmm. the mortuary. Mm -hmm. And you want people exactly. to work without protective clothing. Yeah, it means they are exposed exactly. to all these diseases, mm -hmm. which shouldn't be. And what I don't understand is why they'll be working without protective clothing when most of them work with hospitals. These hospitals provide protective clothing for other health staff. 
Why are you not doing that for the mortuary worker? Because he's part of your staff. Obviously, they are not a and priority. And he's on your payroll, mm. yes. Mm. Mm. And mm. so I think it is important for mm. them because I think when before there will be any change in, mm. for every group, mm -hmm. the people most affected need to be part of the rising up. Mm -hmm. And since they have taken the initiative mm -hmm. to rise up and demand what they are rightfully due, mm. I think it's it's going to put us towards a corrective path. But we are so still, we're still, it's the, the, so they are still threatening the strike if government does nothing. So, I mean, in case, hopefully not, but in case the strike actually happens, how can we even begin to imagine the, the health risk and the health hazard that we will have on our hands as a nation? Well, government also needs to answer certain questions mm. because they insist they have been, Dial well, they're not dialoguing, but it's, they've sent some letters to government mm. which have not been responded to. Who received these letters? Why didn't the person react? Um, was, was there a reason? The person has to come out and give us an excuse because these are Ghanaians. They are a section of the society and their concerns are national concerns. So we, should, we, we need to demand questions from these people. It's part of our accountability. You need to tell us you need to tell us exactly why you haven't responded to them and why you haven't been able to mm. intervene mm. in, you know, solving these problems mm. that they encounter. Mm. We need to know about all these things. Yeah. And the Ministry of Health especially uh, needs to make sure that going forward, their conditions of service are met in a reasonable mm -hmm. way mm -hmm. that at least accommodates them to be able to continue working. I mean, I was, I was quite shocked when I, that, when I read the issues they raised, you know, um, they work on Saturdays, they work on Sundays, they don't have overtime. Most of them are employed on a casual basis. Mm -hmm. And most of the issues... It can be laid off you know, at any time. Exactly. You know, flout the labor law. You know, so we're really hoping that, that you know, this, um, the health ministry comes through with meeting the needs of the uh, uh, morticians. Otherwise, we cannot imagine the crisis that we'll have on our hands. Well, at this point, we'll take a break here. The show continues. Do stay with us. Hello and welcome back. You're still watching Captured by Women. Now, the minority in Parliament do not believe that the 2019 budget will sufficiently tackle what they are calling a recession in the financial sector. The Minister of Finance, however, believes that government is rolling out enough interventions to put the sector back on a growth path. We're going to be examining some of these interventions and finding out exactly how well they will do where the sector is concerned. We have in the studio Mr. Joe Jackson. He's the CEO of Dalex Finance, and he's going to be speaking to these issues and telling us exactly how effective they will be. Mr. Joe Jackson, welcome again to the program. Good, uh, good, evening. good evening, and it's good to be on... Um, Captured. No, to be captured by to women. To be recaptured, because <laughs> this is about your second or third. Yes. Oh, no, I've been quite, oh. quite a few times. You've yes. been captured and released, recaptured. And captured and, and released. And <laughs> so it's, it's, you're, so wel you're welcome once again. Thank you. So, Mr. Joe Jackson, the statistics show that fourth quarter recorded negative 25% growth in the banking sector, financial sector. Do you think this is something that is affecting cross-board all the financial players? To a large extent, yes, because the financial sector should be viewed as a single organism with knock-on effects. When, when something happens to A, there's a transmission effect all around. We are all interrelated, we are all working in the same sector, so an effect on one maybe will be minimized on the other, but it will still be felt. And the 25% contraction is huge. That means a quarter of all the value has been eroded. All right. But um, I remember the Bank of Ghana, the governor of the Bank of Ghana, he mentioned that it was just some 10% of uh, these banks that were feeling the pinch. And so we cannot quickly assume that it's the whole sector that is being faced, you know, that is facing a crisis. Well, here's how I'll put it, right? If 500 people are ill with malaria, mm -hmm. it's not a big deal. It's a big deal, but not a big deal because malaria is not contagious. If one person is affected by Ebola, because of the knock-on effect, mm. we will jump and attack the disease and kill it. When you have a run on the institutions, like we've seen with Unicredit, we've seen with uh, 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 GN Bank, and, and quite a few of the other institutions where the uh, depositors are unable to get their funds out. And they request it. That is Ebola. Mm. That is mm. contagious. That can spread. So. 
in as much as I agree that it has started with with 10% of the institutions, that effect can affect others. And we've got to make sure that that effect is, is reduced. Also, remember that it's easy for us to say, oh, the big banks are okay. The big banks cater to the high net worth and the bigger corporates. Mm -hmm. But the real sector, the watcher seller, the plumber, <coughs> the entrepreneur who drills boreholes, who makes uh, 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 pure, water. Uh, pure water, who who has a business delivering uh, frying chips and pork, and so on, and I could go on and on and on. Are these people in that ten, in that in the big banks, mm -hmm. and how much are they affected by what is happening? You may say that ten percent of the savings of people are at risk. But you see, you are talking about those who have a 500 CD saving and a 1,000 CD saving. But for them, that is the world. Mm -hmm. It's not about somebody who has a million CDs in the bank. So again, because of the knock-on effect, to because of the real effect on the real economy, I think a lot more ought to be done to arrest the situation with the banks. I mean, and it's not, it's not with the financial sector. And it's not just that, look at it. Look at GN Bank. Look at the people who go and bank in GN Bank. GN Bank is not a bank where the high net worth gentleman coming with his posh They cayenne. are on the ground. They are on the ground. So when GN Bank faces a run, it is people on the ground who can't get their deposits out. And these are the masses. And the masses. And, 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 and we all heard Dr. Ngum go on a tour, try and, 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 and fix it. It wasn't fixed. Mr. Jackson, let me come in at this point in talking about the whole conversation about um, the financial sector and to talk about, um, if we can call it the, the, uh, the biggest event of the week, which was the budget that was read by the finance minister yes. on Thursday. Um, first of all, what is your overall impression about the, about the budget? Before we now zoom in to look at the specifics of what he shared with Ghanaians. There were parts of the budget that were positive. And again, he will talk about the numbers. Inflation has dropped. Mm. Growth has increased. We've rebased. Our debt to GDP d ratio has dropped. Our, our, our uh, 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 foreign exchange reserves have increased. And you could go on and on and on about all these great statistics. Mr. Jackson, before we get into that, I want us to take a quick listen uh, to one of the interventions that the finance minister mentioned during the budget 2019, and then we'll come back and examine it. The budget statement, which is the third under the Ekufuado administration, was themed a stronger economy for jobs and security. The minister revealed the 35% income tax ban, which was introduced in the media budget review, has been revised. The government proposes to re review this ban to impact monthly income above 20,000. The minister also announced a review of tax exemptions, which many economists have advised as a revenue mobilization measure. To simplify the collection of withholding tax for both small mining, small scale mining operators and tax authorities. The point of collection of the tax will be shifted to the point of export. Other tax policy introductions include the development of an e-commerce tax policy, review of tax exemptions policy, and withholding tax on small-scale mining. The government's first ever budget, christened as Sempa Budget, read in March 2017, brought to life the flagship policy, free SHS, and the abolishing of taxes termed nuisance tax. The second, a Juma budget, read in November 2017, promised to bring about jobs and economic prosperity for Ghanaians. The 2019 budget was dubbed a stronger economy for jobs and security. So, Mr. Jackson, um, the budget was finally read on Thursday after you know much expectation of it, and um, there's been a lot of talk, and there will still be a lot of talk uh, going on for a while. But what are your immediate impressions about the budget? Well, first of all, the budget spoke about a lot of positive things. Um, it spoke about growth. Growth has increased. Uh, the debt to GDP ratio had, had uh, dropped. And there were a number of things that he said the inflation has come down, uh, our reserves have risen, 
and you could go on and on and on. The challenge I have is that all this is fine, and yet the, 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 the budget statement admits that the man in the street is still feeling a pinch, a pinch, a sense of malaise, mm -hmm. a sense that I don't know whether my job it will be there for me tomorrow. My customers are not paying. My business is not growing. Uh, I find it harder to get money out of my guardian for my school fees. And, and on and on and mm -hmm. on and it's it's so there's a certain disconnect between the those man. those larger numbers the what we call the the macroeconomic indicators we've seen also rosy so the and, 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 and and the reality on the ground and it's easy to say to people that oh we've reduced taxes and uh, electricity taxes have come down and petroleum taxes have come down but again, petroleum taxes may have come down, but the cost of fuel has still gone up. Uh, 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 no taxes on minimum wage. Pardon? No taxes on minimum, on minimum wage, wage, which will relieve but, the ordinary man. But, but we're still feeling the pinch. Uh, there's supposed to be food prices are supposed to have come down. Mm. But I assure you that I don't feel as if uh, 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 my, my food costs less and, right. and pure water prices have gone up. Mm. And so what you have is that this, one of the expectations I had for this budget was to address firmly the issues that people at the bottom are facing as different from what the broader numbers tell us. Right. Let's talk about the banking sector. Yes. When you listened to the budget reading, was there anything that stood out for you that you think will put the sector back on track? The short, simple answer is no. The banking sector is facing a major contraction. Some estimates have gone as high as 25% over the last year. The banking sector is facing a run on deposits. And you can see that from all the uh, uh, appeals from Dr. Indom about GN Bank and all the and Unicredit and all the uh, anecdotal evidence we see from uh, 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 WhatsApp and social media of people taking their blankets and going to sleep, sleep in, the banking in banking halls demanding their money. These are not high net worth people. Mm. These are real Ghanaians. These are real people from the real economy who are feeling the pinch. Which means that the budget addressed the macro yes. but did not come down to the micro level. Exactly. And one of the things I would say, the reason why the banking sector is so important is the banking sector is one of the major transmission mechanisms from which things that happen at the micro come down to you. Because when uh, a bank lends money, it creates... Creates money. Creates money, money. And it creates business. So I lend money, and then somebody goes to build uh, a, a school block. And when he builds a school block... Hires people. A, 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 a plumber is, is recruited, a mason is recruited, and so on. And if that lending does not go on, everything halts. So part of this challenge we have is that people are hoarding their money because they are scared. They don't even want to take it to the banks. And even the banks are even more scared of lending. So the issue about not feeling it at the bottom is also partly because of that intermediation job mm -hmm. that is to be done by the banks to move money from where there are surpluses to where the money is needed and in the process increased prosperity for everyone has been artificially stopped because everyone is afraid. Bankers don't know when somebody's going to come and ask for the money. So if I have money, I don't lend mm -hmm. because if I lend and you come and ask for your money, I don't have money to pay you. Mm -hmm. But Mr. Jackson, you talk about, okay, so you mentioned that for you overall, the bottom line is that people are not feeling a direct impact um, in their pocket. Yes. Now, the minister outlined quite a number of areas in the budget. Um, they talk about uh, interventions in 2019 for energy, for railway, for housing. I mean, eventually when all these things materialize next year, that must certainly have some, uh, will have some Im impact on the on the on the I mean on the, the banking person sector? on the on the street wouldn't you say so because they've listed quite a number for so for next year what their focus will be in specific sectors and that or well expected um, an expectation should make 
some impact. Are you saying that all these interventions are totally, oh, def um, definitely would, wouldn't hit that mark? No, nobody can say that. Okay. Mm -hmm. The two challenges I have, mm -hmm. number one is our track record for getting interventions through. Mm -hmm. It's not exactly stellar. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. the number of interventions that we we we, we you, and two. Since you mentioned interventions, one of the interventions is the recapitalization of the banks. Of the banks, uh, some economists have argued that we haven't sufficiently tackled the depreciation of the city enough for recapitalization to work in the long term. Uh, I, 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 I even have a bigger challenge with right. the the recapitalization of the banks. What's your challenge? So I had money in, in one of the banks, uh, be it Beige, Consolidate, uh, uh, Beige Royal, Sovereign, Unibank, mm -hmm. or Construction. And that money has been, uh, was, was put into Consolidated Bank. Yeah. Then I go to Consolidated Bank, and it was, say, a fixed deposit. Mm -hmm. I go to Consolidated Bank, and the money that originally was placed at, say, 25%, Consolidated Bank tells me that it is now going to give me 7.5%. I, I think I've heard a few people mention similar. Which is lower than even the headline inflation rate we announced this, right. this month. Then on top of that, you tell me that I'm being forced to, to, to take that money as a bond for five years. Now You're extending your tenure of investment? What that means is that effectively, even though you have protected my money, my money you have one, forced me to keep it longer than I would wish. And still giving you a lower interest rate. And giving me a lower interest rate than inflation. What are you doing to me? So You're making a loss at the end of the day. Thank you. So the thing you've got to look at is that these so-called interventions, uh, they glitter, but they are not gold. Because uh, you need to go into the finer details of the interventions. You need to go into the finer details of these interventions. Which are not palatable. Which are not very palatable. So all of a sudden, the government will say, oh, there's a big uh, issue and we have to issue a bond. If the bond was bought by people who, who, for who they didn't have a choice, mm -hmm. and it was not by people who had surplus funds, then we have a little problem. Mm -hmm. Because the money is not still available. And there's still no acceleration towards recouping yes. what has been used to you know, consolidate these banks. Thank you. And then you talk about housing. Housing is great. But there are several, several conditions. It must be truly low cost. If you're going to give me a house, and you're going to sell this house to me, at this uh, $50,000 house, mm -hmm. which is now close to $250 million, I'll spend my lifetime and I wouldn't have finished paying for the house. Mm -hmm. Just in, in wrapping up, the, 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 the finance minister, um, before he read the budget, shared some expectations. And if I can mention a few, he said... The budget was an opportunity for wealth creation. It was an opportunity to deliver on the hopes and expectations of Ghanaians, and it reflects government's commitment to building human capital. Are these expectations seen and glaring in the 2019 budget? I, I'm searching hard. You're still searching hard. I'm searching hard. I'm still looking at the budget in detail. But I tell you, on first, my first look at this, I'm not sure I share the optimism for the of the financial uh, of the of the finance minister mm. I, 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 I can see what has been done I, anybody who says nothing has been done is not right. right but all I see is that all these things are at the top and somewhere in the bottom there is a real person who has who is not a high net worth individual mm -hmm. who doesn't work for a big oil company mm -hmm. who doesn't and who is feeling the pinch who has lost his job in the financial sector who has, was trying to make a living, and it's a still tough. Hmm. It is still tough. Well, <laughs> you have been listening to Mr. Joe Jackson, CEO of Dalex Finance. What he's saying is that the interventions rolled out by the 2019 budget are at the macro level, and he's concerned about how long it will take to trickle down to the real Ghanaian on the bottom. We're going to go for a break. When we come back, we're still here. staying with us. So the special prosecutor, Mr. Martin Amidu, is in the news again, decrying the near hopelessness of his office. A year after 
it was established by the president. He talks about inadequate funding. He talks about inadequate office space. Well, fortunately, the Minister for Finance has indicated that the 2019 budget, the office of the special prosecutor has been allocated 180 million cities. So does this solve all of its problems? To discuss this and other matters, we have been joined by lawyer Evans Gadetto Jikunu, who is a private legal practitioner. Sir, good afternoon and thanks for joining us on the show. Good afternoon. Thanks for the opportunity. All right. So, Mr. Um, Jikunu, mm -hmm. let's look at 180 million Ghana cities and let's aim high. Is this enough to fight corruption among public sector workers in Ghana? Well, it is good news that at least now government has made some efforts in providing funds for the office of special prosecutor. We are all aware that for some time now, the special prosecutor has come up publicly to, you know, show his disappointment regarding government's failure to assist him in doing his work as a special prosecutor. Mm -hmm. He has complained about how to get facilities, recruiting people to set up the office, Even a number of things. Even access to information that has is been it. a challenge. Yes. So government has always said that it, it is in a position to provide all the facilities and the funds needed by the special prosecutor. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, in today's budget, we've been told by the Minister for Finance that 180 million Ghana city has been provided for the office. Mm -hmm. Regarding whether or not that amount will be adequate or not, I think that... That's about uh, 15 million cities a month. 15 million cities a month. I won't be, technically speaking, I won't be in a position to know what goes into providing for the special prosecutor's but office. does it increase the public expectation? Because uh, 180 million cities, the ordinary Ghanaians, that's a lot of money. Does it increase your expectation of the special prosecutor's office? For me, the mere fact that government has demonstrated its commitment in ensuring that the office work as is expected, that is enough. The issue of whether or not it will be adequate or not adequate, we can only deal with that issue when he starts his work. But, the legal, but we, the, there's still a legal dimension that has not been solved. Has, is, uh, is there not? Because we know that he mentioned, I mean, he actually wrote an article and listed all his um, grievances, so to speak. Right? He mentioned that there's still a lack of uh, subsidiary legislation. So that is still outstanding. So he, the office of the special prosecutor is still not out of the woods yet. It is true. Mm. Monies have been allocated. Mm -hmm. However, I am not happy that, you know, it's about getting to a year now. Mm. Legisl no legisl legislative instrument mm. has been, mm -hmm. you know, provided to assist him in doing his work. Because if you look at Section 78 of the Special Prosecutor Office Act, mm -hmm. Act 959, it is provided in Section 78 that within 90 days upon assumption of, of office, office, within 90 days upon assumption of office, the Attorney General and Minister of Justice should, in consultation with the board, should come out with a legislative okay. instrument okay. that will prescribe all the you know, the job that the special prosecutor would do. If you permit me, I will refer you to... Can he work without it? It will be difficult for him to work without it because if you look at the office of prosecutor, the functions of the office of the prosecutor, if you look at the, the Act 959, for instance, the special pr prosecutor is to ensure that he investigates and prosecutes special, specific cases of corruption and corruption uh, corruption of uh, offenses and then also to recover proceeds from corruption and corruption related offenses and also to prevent prevent corruption mm. if you look at this job he needs a lot of financial support he needs a lot of resources Legal he, support. he needs to recruit people and all that and if you look at the ally that is supposed to be you know uh, put in place to ensure that he does his way effectively. If you give me the opportunity, if I will refer you to Section 78 
of Act 959 briefly. Mm. That tells you that without the LI, it will be very difficult for him to do his job. For instance, we have, if I may read. Please do. The minister shall within 90 days upon the assumption of office of the special prosecutor in consultation with the board by legislative instrument make regulations, that is the ally, mm -hmm. regulations to A, prescribe the manner for tracing tainted property. B, prescribe the procedure for declaration of property and income. C, prescribe the procedure for the seizure of tainted property. D, prescribe the procedure for the management of assets seized under this act. Prescribe the procedure for the management of assets in respect of which a freezing order has been issued under this act. Okay, lawyer. A lot mm. of them. Mm. So this tells us that mm. if you look at the function of a special prosecutor, mm. with that an ally put in place, it will be very difficult for him to perform So essentially, his even though he has now been allotted some money, He's, he's still, still handicapped. Still he won't handicapped. do much. Legally, he's, legal he's, still handicapped. Mm. he's still handicapped. Mm. He's still handicapped. Mm. That is my view. Mm. Now, let's look at the special prosecutor's office broadly, in general. Some people have argued that we do not even need a special prosecutor's office. Essentially, it's a waste of resources because the attorney general should be able to do that job. Do you agree with this? Well, to some extent, I do. To some extent. But as a country... We have always said that because the position of the Attorney General and Minister of Justice is a political position, it is always difficult for the Attorney General to work mm. effectively. To be non biased? That is it. For which reason we have decided to initially, there were attempts to divorce the position of Attorney General from a uh, position of Minister for Justice. Mm -hmm. However, to circumvent that, they decided to bring the position of special, special prosecutor, prosecutor so that he will be somehow independent. The new Though he still work under the attorney general, mm -hmm. he will be somehow more independent. So for me, it is true that we have other uh, security agencies like the police, the uh, Yoko, we have the BNI, we have other security agents that can do the same thing. However, if you look at corruption in general, usually it is out of politics that most of these corruption cases occur. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if you put somebody there whose focus it will be to investigate and prosecute uh, specific cases of corruption and corruption related offenses, I think that to some extent it is better. We would have solved some of the problems or we, our fears would have been allayed, particularly the fact that Many people don't have confidence in attorney general investigating and prosecuting cases because they think that so far as some of those involved in some of the corruption related cases are politicians or friends and family members or politicians and others. And if attorney general is uh, investigating and prosecuting such people, it can incur the wrath of you know, uh, some of the party right. people. That is why I think that the office of the special prosecutor will be more effective. You know, uh, Mr. Amidu, in the, the article that he published, mentioned two issues. He talked about the fact that um, there was a missing link, sort of a disconnect, when it comes to the civil society space and how the civil society or some civil society organizations um, are blaming uh, uh, government or the president for what is going on. But the, Natural reaction to that would be, well, the president, you know, led the forefront for establishing the office of the uh, special yeah. prosecutor. So, therefore, naturally, if things are not working out or things one year on are not as they should be, then the president m must be blamed. What do you think of Mr. Amidu's take on that one? I think that he's right. Mm. We, one thing we should know is that if we should hold the president blameworthy, mm. It is true to some extent because we all know as a fact that one of the campaign promises of MPP is to establish the office of special yeah. prosecutor. Mm. So if you, you claim you are fulfilling that promise, you ought to act such that you have hope in what you are doing. So if it's not a question of their establishing the office, but whether or not the office will be more effective mm. in investigating and prosecuting 
specific cases of oh, corruption, corruption and corruption uh, related offenses. He also talked about the electorate and he said that electorate, like people, um, should support the work of the uh, uh, special prosecutor and that people should join the fight against corruption. But in essence, from what we've discussed so far, where even though the money has been allotted, he doesn't have the legal backbone to do his work. So and with all the petitions that people sent to his office, in essence, that defeats the idea about getting yes. the, uh, the support from the citizenry, isn't it? Yeah, that is why I said that, yes, it's true that having provided 180 million Ghana cities, mm, mm. at least there has the been some demonstration mm. of the desire to fight corruption. Mm, mm. However, with the absence of the ally, mm. it will be difficult. If you look at what the ally is supposed to do mm -hmm. under Section 78 of the Act 959, mm. it shows clearly that without the ally, he will find it difficult to do his work mm. effectively. Mm. 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 You, you understand? Yeah. That is why I think that, well, the president has achieved that objective of setting up the office. However, Without the needed support for the office of the special okay. prosecutor, without putting the necessary, you know, resources in place, the office will not be able to work effectively. Mm. Mr. Gadifu, let's look at the issue of his inability to access information that is required, especially for public servants. Initially, he, he said he writes to these public servants requesting information. Nobody responds. How do we solve that issue? Well, you see... That is why I'm saying that, you know, putting the ally in place is very yes. important because if you look at all the functions that he's supposed to perform as a special prosecutor, mm -hmm. with that the ally, most of these things you will find it difficult to do them. Right. You understand? So having having provided the funds, that is not enough. The government should take a further step particularly the, mini, the Attorney General and Minister for Justice, to ensure that the LI is put in place. If you want information from the public, how do you get information from the public? You need some legal backing yeah. mm -hmm. to obtain the information from the public. It is true that an, uh, he has power to receive complaints from the general public yeah. and act upon this information, complaints and others. But regarding, you know, uh, uh, you know, getting information, what happens if the people are reluctant to, re to give you information? Mm -hmm. That's why this right to information... There needs to be a compelling force. That it is very important that that bill is passed because this, in large extent, will also assist the office of the special prosecutor. It's very important. Mm -hmm. Because getting information, you need legal backing. How do you obtain information from the general public? Are you going to work on the benevolence of the general public so that people willingly, voluntarily, should give you the information? Is that what you are going to work mm, on? Mm. You understand? What about where it is very important that you work with a particular information, but the people are Concealing. reluctant to give you the information? What do you do? Mm. Legal you backing. understand? Mm. So he has the powers to get the information. However, without the LI, it will be very difficult for him to actualize this. So he needs the mind. LI to enforce mm. his that powers. Is it. Mm. That so, is it. So Mr. Jikunu, in wrapping up, um, would you say that the Office of the Special Prosecutor is the panacea to end, well, can we end corruption? Let's say eliminating corruption to a large extent in the country. For me, I can say that this is the panacea mm. in, in, in eliminating corruption in mm. Ghana. Mm. But to some extent, mm. I think that it will help in minimizing corruption and corruption-related corruption offenses in Ghana. Okay. Mm. Just had in the studio um, lawyer Evans Gadetto Jikunu, who is a private legal practitioner, giving us some insights into the activities of the Office of the Special Prosecutor and especially the fact that even though government has allo allocated 180 million CDs to the office, it still needs that legal backbone to do its work. We'll take a break here. Please stay with us. The show still continues.
Well, this is all we have for you on Captured by Women today. Thank you for staying with us. In today's agenda, we looked at the Mortuary Workers Association and their intended strike, which has been put on hold pending negotiations with government. We also went on to look at the financial sector and the interventions that were rolled out in the budget 2019, how well they will impact putting the sector back on recovery path. Mr. Joe Jackson was here with me, and he expressed the opinion that the macro-level interventions are going to take a long time to trickle down to the ordinary man, and he is not too enthused about that. We also went on to look at the Office of the Special Prosecutor, and there are so many expectations of the Special Prosecutor, especially now that 180 million Ghana cities has been allocated for 2019 to the Special Prosecutor's Office. So many people are expecting him to deliver results. Will he deliver? We'll find out very soon. My name is Nuong Falong. I've been on the show with Rosemond Aite. This program is proudly sponsored by Nido and GTP. Do join us again next week Saturday right here on TV3. Good afternoon. Captured by Women is brought to you by Nido Fortigrew, your love, their future.